Okay, good morning, everyone. Sorry, we were starting a little bit late. We had some technical difficulties, but looks like we got the slides up. We just want to go back one slide. Oh, okay, there we go. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the CGMC webinar. We are discussing unemployment insurance today. Um, it's a pretty hot topic, um, mostly because for cities, you know, we end up being on the hook for more than the typical um, employer is just because um, you're going to have to reimburse the specific account for that. So I thought we thought it would be a good um, opportunity to just kind of discuss the whole process, what it looks like appealing decisions, um, and just kind of describe the background and then also kind of um, preventing these UI claims. Um, so I should introduce myself. I'm Christina Petsoulis. I'm an attorney with Flaherty and Hood, focusing on labor and employment. And I'm joined by um, a law clerk that we have at the firm, and she'll be doing some of the presenting. Her name is Angel Waneros. Um, so we'll get started. All right, I am Angel Waneros, and we just ask that you use the question and a function for any questions that you have throughout this presentation. Um, so throughout this, we plan on talking about just the introduction to unemployment insurance benefits, uh, a large important aspect that we want to cover city payments. Um, we're going to discuss the eligibility and ineligibility for unemployment insurance. And then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into appealing determinations and, you know, preventative measures for unemployment insurance claims. So unemployment insurance provides benefits to workers who um, become unemployed through no fault of their own. This includes full-time employees that work um, 32 hours or more a week and seasonal employees are also covered so long as they meet that general statutory eligibility requirements that we'll discuss a little bit further on. So the initial process looks typically like the employment or the applicant will apply and the employer um, it will be notified and then deed will request information from the employer and then deed will ultimately make a determination based on all of the information that they've been provided from the employee and the employer. And then either the employee or the employer will be able to appeal this determination and then we're just going to talk a little bit about city payments. <clears throat> so unlike private sector employers, um, most Minnesota cities will opt to pay for unemployment insurance on a reimbursement basement basis. Um, cities pay that Minnesota unemployment tr insurance trust fund an amount that is typically equal to the employment benefit paid to its former employee. Um, this is calculated determining the base period by first determining that base period of employment. Um, this is the first four of the last five calendar quarters preceding the week. And then the weekly benefit amount is the higher of 50% of the individual's average weekly wage. And this is during the, either the high quarter of the base period or the total base period. And then the weekly benefit amount is capped at 857 a week. Um, the mass, the maximum amount of the benefits is the lesser of the 26 times the individual's weekly benefit amount or one third of the individual's total base period wages. And we'll give you an example on the next slide. So looking at this, it's just an estimate of what it could typically look like. Um, so an employee with about um, an $80,000 salary that applies for unemployment benefits um, in this example. So if they're deemed eligible, the city is typically would be required to pay that 50% of the salary. Um, so here, the city would be required to pay the lesser of either the 50% weekly, so 769 times 26, so roughly 20,000, or in the alternative, the 80,000 times a third, which would be 26,000. Here, since the lesser is the 20,000, they would be on the hook for the 20,000. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about the eligibility and eligibility standards for um, the unemployment insurance benefits. So generally, um, for eligibility, we look at the statutory eligibility. Um, and then typically they look at a quit because of a good cause reason caused by an employer. This is usually an exception to the rule of quitting. And then ineligibility, an employee who quits employment and the employment based on misconduct. So for eligibility, um, we look at Minnesota statute 268.085. This just lays out the general eligibility. And then we also look at um, statute 268.095. Um, there is an exception to quitting for based on a good cause reason caused by the employer. So general eligibility covers a broad scope, but typically um, the more key parts are that it covers employees working 32 hours or more a week. And this does include seasonal employees um, with a, a little bit more that they have to be actively looking for employment during their off season. Um, and then eligibility based on a quit due to a good cause reason by an employer. This is the exception to a just typical quit. Um, so this is something that is directly related to employment and for which the employer is responsible. Um, this is something that is adverse to the worker and that would compel an average reasonable worker to quit and become unemployed rather than remaining in employment. So typically the unemployment judge will look at the statutory um, interpretation, but courts after the fact consider other aspects for good cause. Um, so what may constitute good cause for refusing to accept an employer's working conditions? They consider whether employee's reason for quitting was compelling and whether it was real and not imaginary. They call it substantial and not trifling, something that's reasonable and not whimsical or capricious. And we'll go through a couple of examples. So in this case, um, there was an employee that applied for unemployment insurance benefits after quitting based on sexual harassment by a coworker of which her employment was or employer was aware the supervisor gave no assurance that the problem would be corrected and instead the supervisor told the employee to take it as a joke so in this instance the court held that while complain the complaining employee must typically give the employer opportunity to take appropriate steps before quitting employment. But if upon reporting the incident, an employee was given no assurance the problem would be corrected, the employee has a good reason to quit. And then we have another example um, in Trago v. Hennepin County. Um, an employee argued that there was unfavorable working conditions that constituted good cause to resign. Um, in this instance, the employee's unfavorable working conditions were based on dis dissatisfaction with the employee's choice of interim director. Here, um, the court found where an employee becomes dissatisfied with the board's choice of interim director, it's not enough to constitute good cause attributable to the employer. In another example of a not good cause reason, um, in ports, versus Pipestone Gallegas, an employee was personally dissatisfied with the working conditions and favoritism allegedly was shown to other employees and he quit, alleging a good cause reason caused by the employer. And again, in this instance, the court found that the employee did not have a good cause reason caused by the employer to quit because the good cause attributable to the employer does not encompass instances where the employee is just frustrated or dissatisfied with those working conditions. Um, as far as ineligibility, we look at statute 268.095. Um, here we're going to talk about the subdivision for just a typical quit and then subdivision six based on employment misconduct. So ineligibility based on a quit 
This um, under the statute is when an employee voluntarily quits a job, they are disqualified from receiving all employment benefits. Um, as discussed earlier a little bit, there is an exception when the applicant quit employment based off a good reason caused by the employer. And the courts typically look at for termination of unemployment based on misconduct. They consider employment misconduct to be intentional, any intentional, negligent, or indifferent conduct on the job or off the job that disregards the standards of behavior that an employer has the right to expect of the employee or disregards the employee's duties and obligations to the employer. So statutory requirements are what the unemployment judge will look at. And then when um, courts have to consider looking at these cases for misconduct, they also, uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court has been often looking at whether the employee deliberately violated the standards of behavior, which the employer has a right to expect of its employees, whether an employee's conduct adversely affects the business or other employee morale, and whether the employee ignored past warnings. <laughs> so uh, an example we have for misconduct is in McGowan v. versus Executive Express Transportation Enterprises Incorporated. Um, here an employee was employed as a delivery driver and was terminated after refusing to pick up a personal prescription for her supervisor. Um, this was a responsibility within the job description. Um, here, the court found that in general, refusing to abide by an employer's reasonable policies and request does amount to disqualifying them for misconduct. And in Res versus Abbott Northwestern Hospital, the court explained that even in refusing to run a personal errand for an employer in a smaller business, it can constitute misconduct because that employee's refusal adversely affects the company's operations. In a sec second example of misconduct in Stag versus Vintage Place Incorporated, an employee was ultimately discharged in violation of the employer's policy, which required employees to notify the supervisor two hours prior to the start of a shift if they were going to be absent or late for that shift. Um, after except here in this instance, after excessive absentees and tardiness, the employer ultimately terminated the employee for misconduct. And as a result, that employee applied for unemployment benefits. Um, in this instance, the Supreme Court of Minnesota decided that the employee violated the employer's standards of behavior because the record showed that the employee was aware and knew he was expected to follow the policy set out. And then if anyone has any questions, we can take a second to recap anything that I've covered thus far. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the Q&A. So I do urge you guys, if you're coming up with questions in your mind or have any um, thing to add, we would appreciate you just putting in the Q&A box. So it's at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A. So just click that and then send us a message um, just so we can make sure we're covering all the right stuff. Um, so we're going to actually go into um, looking at appealing uh, these determinations that Angel was just talking about. So um, as she discussed, once the employer has the opportunity to basically respond to the information after the um, employee submits those, um, uh, you know, the application for UI benefits, um, deed will come up with a determination, either they're eligible or not eligible. And either the employer or the employee, depending on the result, will have the ability to appeal the decision. Um, so we're just gonna look at kind of that process and what that looks like. Um, and then we'll look at preparing for that hearing, um, putting documents together, witness prep, and then I'll give you some tips for testifying as well. So here's the process in a nutshell. So as I discussed, you'll get the determination from deed. And then um, again, either the employer or the employee will um, basically file an appeal 
Um, you can do that electronically. I know a lot of you have portals set up, which is probably the most efficient way. Um, DEED has had a history of being very slow with mail and fax. So um, I would urge you to set up those electronic accounts if you haven't already. Um, and um, anyway, that is how the appeal uh, can be uh, started. And it's really simple. It's just, you don't really have to provide anything substantive in that process. It's basically checking a box. I don't agree with the decision. And then what will happen is um, DEED will schedule a hearing with um, an unemployment law judge. So they'll give you a date. And I think it gives you a few options on the portal. Um, and then I would say around, around this time, another step that would need to be taken is just considering whether you want legal counsel. Um, some of these cases can be very complicated. And as Angel kind of demonstrated before with the payments, the cities or you know, other public employers can be on the hook for a lot of money. So it might be worth an investing in getting legal counsel to, to represent you at the hearing. Uh, the hearings are conducted by phone, uh, but they're, they're conducted like a normal hearing with um, direct and cross-examination. The unemployment law judge will ask um, a series of questions, just kind of background information, just trying to get the full story from both the employee and the employer. Um, and then there'll be an opportunity for closing arguments and things like that. Um, for the ones that I've been involved in, I mean, some of them last around two hours and sometimes even there's more to discuss, so they last longer than that and need to be continued to a different day. Um, so any decisions by the unemployment law judge, they can be reviewed with a request for reconsideration. Um, that's basically just um, kind of appealing the appeal and um, basically asking the judge to reconsider their decision, and then they'll issue that decision. But then the step after this could be actually an appeal to the Minnesota Court of Appeals. So we can go to the next slide. All right, so we put together some stuff for just kind of some tips for preparing for the appeal hearing. So the judge will consider written evidence in and then um, put them, you know, basically admit them into evidence as exhibits. And so um, the first step here is just putting together all documentation that you have around the employee's termination or resignation or quit. Um, so that's, that's the main thing. So if you have a notice of termination letter, we urge you to um, give that and you can do it through the portal. And I believe that you can um, either mail it or fax, but um, that's the best way to do it. And then include in their documentation, discipline and counseling, all previous, because I think, um, you know, usually the judge likes to look at in a complete record of service from the employee just to get an idea of the history. Um, so that would include any performance reviews. Um, I would urge you to add those. And then um, as Angel kind of stressed before, what the judge will be looking at is whether the employee violated any sort of policies or expectations that the, um, the employer had on them. So it's really important to um, put into those documents any personnel policies that um, were violated. You don't need to do the entire personnel policy, but just give um, you know pieces of that policy that you are um, trying to prove that they uh, violated. And then the other piece of that would be an acknowledgement of that personnel policy, showing that the employee reviewed and read that, that particular policy and signed it. Um, so those are all important to the judge. I mean, the, obviously the hearing and the questions that they ask is important, but they like to be, um, they like to be directed to certain pieces of documentation during the hearing. So this um, preparing documentation is a very important step. And then second, I would just say, so review that record, and I put it in quotes record, so all this documentation that I'm discussing, and make sure that you understand the full story. So, um, you know, depending on the position that you're in, yeah, you know that the person was terminated or resigned, but you don't always have the full story, so I would urge you to um, discuss with other um, employees, other witnesses that might have been around that can um, basically attest to certain things that were going on in the workplace. Um, because the last thing you want, and this happens a lot, is sometimes new information comes up in the hearing. You know, the employee brings something up that you didn't even know about, and that's the last thing you, that you want. So um, investigation is too harsh of a word, but doing kind of, you know, that due diligence of, of really trying to understand the full story and thinking about the employee's perspective and what they might bring up in the hearing is really important. So we can go to the next slide. So the third thing... Um, is just really focusing on what needs to be proven. So um, 
that's you know what Angel went over previously. So either you're going to be proving employee, you're going to be trying to prove employee misconduct, or um, whether there was a you know that there wasn't rather there wasn't a good cause for quit. So with the first misconduct, I mean, you really have to show again, as I said, that the employee violated a certain standard. It doesn't always need to be written, but it needs to be articulated at least at the hearing that the employer did have this reasonable standard um, and that the employee um, was shown to actually violate that standard. And then the second thing with um, showing not good cause, that would just be um, kind of hammering home those, those, um, those factors that Angel went over, those three different factors, um, because that is really what the judge will be looking at. The judges like to be very um, concise and methodical about it. They very strictly look at the statute. They look at the definition of employee misconduct, and they're really just trying to touch on those specific points at the hearing um, and then reach a result. And then four, I would say, choose the right witnesses. So there are some people that can naturally just tell a story and um, provide it well. And then there's some people who might ramble and um, might lead in the wrong direction. And I would say it's really important because judges really care about credibility in these hearings. I mean, there isn't a lot of harsh evidence rules, so they're really going to care about who is telling the story um, candidly but honestly. Um, so I would say choose the right witnesses. And I think this goes back to kind of the other pieces of just doing your due diligence to talk to people, who see who has key information about the situation, and then choosing them um, as your witnesses. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is kind of touching on what I just mentioned. So what does a judge really care about? Again, credibility is huge to them. Um, so just having um, you know, the right witnesses give that candid story, but being honest. And um, again, for this, of course, it helps when you have an attorney um, preparing you and trying to steer you in the right direction. Um, but I think what will really help is just focusing on what the judge wants to find out, which is that employment misconduct piece or the reasons for quit. Um, the other thing that they'll look at a lot of times is obviously the grounds for termination, but whether that process was fair. So they'll look at, you know, were previous warnings given? Um, you know, yes, this person did something egregious, but was there other things before that warnings were given is really important to them. Um, basically, did, did the employer give the employee a chance to, to fix or own up to what they did? Um, so that's one piece. And then another piece is, was the employee aware of those policies or expectations on them, right? So if they didn't even know that they had that um, standard that they were supposed to live up to in the workplace, um, the judge is really going to care that, well, you know, the employee didn't know about it. How is he supposed, he or she supposed to know that they were supposed to, um, you know, abide by that certain policy? So that's a big factor for the judges. Um, another one is, um, especially for quit, I mean, any workplace concerns from the employee and how those concerns were addressed. So a lot of times we see with the quits, you know, somebody will quit and then in that quit letter, they'll list complaints, either new complaints or old complaints. So the judge will be looking at, you know, how did their employer really address those concerns? Um, did they speak to the employee when they brought up that concern? Did they do their due diligence to look into the issue? Um, um, and things like that, those are really important to the judge because the judge doesn't want to, um, what I've noticed is, you know, they don't want the employer to be hiding any sort of, for lack of a better word, shady activity or anything like that. So they um, really try to bring that kind of workplace, workplace concern and workplace environment to light when they have these hearings. Um, so that's also an important piece. And then the the last thing I wanted to add was just, um, you know, who has authority over employment decisions? So, you know, a lot of times the, you know, the judges are having these hearings with all different types of employers, right? So private, public, and they don't always have a clear understanding of who has authority. So in this case, um, you know, either city council or whatever um, commission that, you know, the public, whoever is the um, higher authority, or if, you know, the city manager or their city administrator has that authority. That's something I think it's important to bring up in the hearing, um, you know, because a lot of times the HR director doesn't have the direct authority to remove. So it's important to um, kind of bring that to light and kind of give, give the judge a little bit more understanding of 
who really has the the authority to discipline or or remove or um, or even just investigate concerns. Um, so that's a big piece. You can go to the next slide. And then I just want to give a few tips for testifying. So I think, like I mentioned before, I think it's important to tell a story. Um, you know, of course, kind of um, thinking about that story in the context of what needs to be proven, again, the misconduct and the quit. Uh, but uh, it's important to really give give the judge the full story. I mean, they're going to find out anyway, but I, I, I tend to find that the best witnesses are the ones that lead the story on their own and don't need a lot of peppering of questions. And they just, they naturally know what's going to be important to tell. And they tell that in a, in a nice way. And I think that helps with the credibility aspect of it as well. And then the second thing is just be honest. Um, Cause I think, you know, these judges are really good at sniffing out when people aren't being honest. So I think it's really, really important to be honest. Um, and again, if, you know, if, if the employer is worried about some sort of um, thing that they are afraid and they might not know how it might come up in the hearing, of course, it's important to talk to an attorney and see, you know, should I bring this up? Should I not bring this up? How should I bring this up? So um, that's important. And then be concise and remember to answer what is asked. I'm seeing this more um, in regard to when the judge asks like really pointed questions. Um, trying to think of an example. Did the did the employee complain? Yes, and just give a short, you know, little statement uh, because the judges really hate also when kind of there's a lot of rambling. Um, so finding that balance between telling a story in a directed way, but then also being concise in what you say is important to them. Um, and then the last thing, if you want to just go back, Angel. The last thing was just don't be afraid to say you don't know or don't remember. Um, again, it goes back to that being honest piece. You don't need to come up with any sort of answer if you clearly just don't know. It's okay to not know. Um, and sometimes in these hearings, what will happen is judges want more information. And so what they'll do is they'll say, we've had this happen before where they'll ask, oh, is so-and-so in the office? Can we talk to them? So I'd also note that before, I should have noted that before, that that's why it's important to get the full story talk to different witnesses and employees who might be familiar with the situation and just um, kind of get that information so nobody is surprised if the judge wants to speak to a particular person. Um, we can go to the next slide, Angel. So preventing UI claims, I just wanted to go through um, kind of the termination process and then resignation to discuss how we can prevent these UI claims or rather just prevent, you know, employees prevailing when, when they clearly aren't um, eligible for these benefits. So with the termination process, um, especially ensure that your reasons for termination are consistent with past practice and justified in policy. Again, the judges are going to be looking at what is really in policy and what are they holding to what, what, you know, standards are they holding to the employee, um, to ensure kind of that fair process. And then the second thing, absolutely document the reasons for termination and document everything and then cite to those standards and policies violated. So of course, you know, list the reason for termination, but then also very specifically state they violated this standard and maybe even say, um, even if it's not a written standard, you could also just say, you know, you did this and we had a reasonable expectation of expecting this from you. So just really articulating that is gonna be really important down the road um, to, to prevent these types of claims. And then um, the last thing, document any and all issues with performance in detail. So um, even though you think it might not be relevant, it's important if you're going through this termination process, list all previous issues because ultimately they might be related anyway. So that includes you know, the record of service, any past discipline, any written counseling, um, and then be sure to include the negative impacts on the city. That's another thing that um, deed and judges will care about is looking at well, this really negatively impacted the uh, public employer. And uh, that's, that's a big consideration in the decision to remove them. So we can go to the next slide. And then resignation. So the biggest thing is to acknowledge the employee's resignation in writing um, and then just reiterating the certain things that are important, which is that it was voluntary 
and that also listing the requested last day of employment, because a lot of times judges will also ask, well, did they resign, but you told them that they couldn't work till the end of their requested end date. That's really impl important to judges. So be sure to reiterate that last day, the requested last day of employment, and then reiterate that it's voluntary. So, and then if a resignation is given verbally, I urge you to have the employee give you something in writing, um, usually just like a voluntary resignation form that they can just sign saying I voluntarily resigned. Or if they won't do that, then just document it um, in written saying on this date, we talked and you stated that X, Y, Z, this is your voluntary resignation, something like that. So we can go to the next slide. So that pretty much ends where we're at. So we actually have some questions in the q and I'm just gonna review them. So bear with me. Okay, so the first question we have is can you clarify which these no employees are eligible for unemployment? Angel, do you want to cover that one? Yeah, I can. Um, so generally, um, seasonal workers who are laid off may or yeah may apply for unemployment benefits just like any other terminated employee. Um, it just they just need to meet the statutory requirements for the base period pay. Um, so this is that most recent of the four, the last four worked uh, that I kind of touched on a little bit earlier. Um, so it just depends on the last four that they worked prior to trying to apply for those unemployment benefits. I don't know if that helps or not, but let me know if you need more clarification. So for example, Angel, if somebody was like a snowplow driver and they were working from like October through, like they had a set schedule of like October through February or something, and say they were let go in December, they would be eligible. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If you have any follow-up, feel free to send another question in there. Um, we have another question. This is a good one. This one comes up a lot. Do you recommend that we raise an issue for every claim? I generally do, unless the person was a temporary employee. Um, so it, it's a little bit confusing because there are additional issues and there are the issues that deed has already flagged as an issue. So for example, if somebody um, applies and you don't think that they're eligible because they um, were terminated for employment misconduct, for example, they, they being deed would just um, allow you to basically provide information stating, I don't believe that this person is eligible because of employment misconduct. That wouldn't be necessarily raising an issue. That would just be responding to the, the issue that deed already flagged. Um, but if there's a different separate issue that you wanna raise, you can also do that. Um, but I wouldn't say you need to raise it in every case. It actually might confuse the process. But if you have any questions, um, reach out to an attorney or reach out to us. I'm happy to answer and walk through it. I know it can be a little bit confusing. Um, or I would just urge you to just call Deed and ask them and say, this is my situation. What do you think I, you know, should I raise an issue or, and, and not any legal advice, but I mean, it just clear about what do I need to fill out and how do I need to fill it out? This is what I'm trying to communicate to Deed. So that's also a good option is just reaching out. They're pretty available. Their phone number's listed on their website. And um, yeah, usually someone always answers. So that's, that's the best way to do that. Okay. I have another question. Has COVID or working from home changed anything? Um, yes and no. I mean, the standards, the standards for employment as conduct and quit are the same, irregardless of, of working for home or not. Um, obviously, the work environment changes if you're working from home and not um, in the office, but there still can be, you know, cases where you know, the employee is not doing what is expected. They're working from home, but they're not doing what is expected. So just going back to those important key pieces of, you know, is the employee violating standards that you have a right to expect? And then the other thing with quit, you know, is there a good reason for that quit? Okay, another question came in. For seasonal temp workers, is there a way to document the end date so it isn't considered a termination? Or do we need to make them sign a voluntary resignation form? So I would say 
Um, yes, the best way to do that would be the hire letter, right? So um, stating that your season is from this, this date to this date and um, being very clear about that. Um, if you don't have that, then I would agree, yes, um, just have them sign that voluntary resignation form. Um, but then that would mean that they couldn't back to, come back for the next season. So that would be more of a harsh result where you actually had to have them resign. But I would just say, um, yeah, documenting it in the higher letter um, earlier on on the front end would probably be the best way to, to avoid that. Um, or otherwise, if, yeah, if there is a yeah, claim, you would just argue at the hearing or argue to D, this is when the season ended. And the employee knew that the season ended at this time. So um, that's how I would go about that one. Um, trying to see if I have any other ones. Angel, do you see any other questions on your end? No, it looks like we got all the ones that were on there, unless there are some more that might come in. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any additional ones that are coming in. Um, feel free to reach out to us if you have any follow-up questions. Um, we're happy to help. We help, we help um, cities a lot with these hearings, so feel free to reach out to us. Even if you don't want us to represent you at the hearing, we can at least answer some questions and then, you know, also walk you through the um, kind of the, the deed application process as well. Um, we have some other webinars that we have going on. Just wanted to give you a preview for those. So we have one coming up in two days, labor employment laws, grievance complaints, and lawsuits update. That'll be Brandon. Um, and then we have another one, which is a hot topic. I know that a lot of you are, are uh, curious to see kind of the update on the work-related injury and disability landscape, talking about that new para law uh, will be the main focus of that. That one's next week, um, next Tuesday. And then we got a workforce and compensation tools webinar the week after that. So um, stay tuned. I urge you to um, come to those and, and learn more. And then again, reach out to me with any questions. And thank you so much for, for um, joining today. Thank you.